A lot of what I've said has already been, um, what, uh, a lot of what I was planning to say today has already been said. I'm looking at legacy archives um, and what we do with them, uh, particularly because after a long career in excavation, as many of you, um, I've had problems with my own archives. We're looking at um, paper archives given to local excavation authorities who promptly lose them. This happened in the Maghreb. Um, or more elaborate uh, GIS archives given to the local authorities who wipe the hard disk. Um, luckily, in that case, we had copies. Um, but it was on access for and is now reduced to a kind of unhelpful spreadsheet. All of this is a sort of mea culpa to explain my own interest um, in undertaking a survey of what everybody else does. This isn't the survey that Guntram referred to. This is a new one take done in the context of Ariadne together with Holly Wright and Edeltraut Asper of just the national policies in Europe on excavation archives. Is reporting obligatory? And how much of this is available to the public? So responses were received from all of the countries on this map. Um, uh, this is a map of where it's obligatory, and it it needs a series of qualifications because obviously a lot of smaller areas within countries make it obligatory um, in the UK itself, for example. But if you look at it on a national basis, it's obligatory in Eastern Europe. We can work out why. France is there because all of the rescue excavations are carried out by INRAP, who obviously it makes its own reporting obligatory. In cases like Germany, Spain, and Italy, excavation is never, there's no centralized national body that collects excavations. In Italy, you have the 50 soprintendense, all which have their own archives. Um, what's happening now is very obscure because they're breaking up again. Um, but in Spain, although there is a national body, the CIZIC, which in theory is in control, it isn't because, again, each region is responsible for its own archive. And in Germany, it's the Lander, um, so that the Deutsches uh, Archaeologische Institute has only consultative power. So. On the whole, the centralized archive of excavation data seems to depend on the strength of state national institutions as opposed to sponsors of other sorts, like particular universities. However, even where on paper you have good rules about depositing excavations, um, it's, it's not clear that anything actually does happen that way. For example, in Iceland, the National Museum requires interim reports after every season with registers of everything. I mean, it's an absolute total legislation, but um, archaeologists aren't complying this from our source in Iceland. Elsewhere, as in Slovenia, only paper copies are required, and if disks are submitted, this only takes place sporadically. So there's a clear problem about reporting. Um, as far as this map is concerned, incidentally, we didn't get responses from quite a few countries, which I'm going to list. And if any of you were in the audience, tell me. Um, Belgium, Croatia, Finland, Latvia, Luxembourg, and Portugal, and the Slovak Republic are missing. Tell me more if you're here. So. When we turn to the online reporting of 
archaeology, of course, the picture is almost entirely reversed, except for Hungary itself. And um, you see here, obviously, the UK with the ADS, um, the two big French databases, national databases, um, which are uh, the, that of INRAP and OASIS, and Archaeologie de la France Online. Um, and then, of course, you have uh, the one we haven't talked about so far, which is uh, the dance easy online reporting, both obligatory and fully accessible. I mean, this is brilliant stuff, um, and really one of the models, along with ABS. Since 2011, the DAI has been working on the Janus project, um, which is again establishing a na national research database, um, with reporting that will be entirely voluntary, however. And so there's a certain degree of carry, but as we've been seeing, no stick. Elsewhere, the availability of grey literature online is far, far more patchy or barely in the planning stage. So what I want to talk about here is whether there are intermediate steps between the sort of total availability of data, or at least grey literature provided by ADS, and um, what on earth is going on. And it's for this that we established, uh, sorry, that was public ADS, but hardly necessary. Um, it's for this that we established the FASTI online in 2003. What this is, is another form of access to the literature. It comprises very short 500 word notices of what I did last summer at X. It started in Italy, it's expanded to a number of countries, some with more success, some with less. Um, but it gives you access, both GIS and obviously subject based, to what's happening in a particular area. Now, I think that the sort of sociology of this is important. Um, obviously, these, this sort of register, and I'll mention a couple of others, exists as a find it mechanism, as a form of met metadata in itself, giving you links to bigger archives when they're available, giving you at least the name of the director of the excavation and what it's about. Um, it got off to a very slow start in Italy. There were a few, my colleague Helga Du Giuseppe went around Sopra by Sopra and said, here we have this project, you want to play or not? And about three said yes, out of 50. And then luckily the head of um, the uh, relative department of the Ministry of Culture, Stefano De Caro, who's now head of ICROM, saw a presentation and said, oh my God and immediately sent out an order to all the superintendents say not to put their own data online, but to at least make the universities and foreigners and whatever play. So it is now obligatory, and at that point the data grew exponentially. So that for Italy, it's fantastic. For Bulgaria, through the energy of our collaborator, uh, Nikola Teodosiev, it's very, very good. And elsewhere, it's what it is. Spain is doing it on a volunteer basis and has just cleared 100 sites in a year and a half. So always a work in progress, always searching for money just to make itself happen. Uh, Fasti Online goes on. Um, and what it's going to do is, I hope, um, link to other initiatives of the same kind. One of these is Archéologie de la France Online. That seems to be stuck in the bureaucracy. It's not clear that the French government wishes to link to other people's projects. Um, and uh, the Archaeology of Greece Online, which is a very similar initiative carried out by the French and British schools in Athens, um, has just agreed to link to us 
So we're very pleased by that. So this sort of initiative, the National Register, um, is awfully useful. It's even more useful if, like the FASTI, it's bilingual in the national country and in English. And um, it's easier for archaeologists to comply because it takes them 10 minutes to fill in the form. But again, it works best with coercion. Um, that's the uh, archaeology of Greece online. And then we get the problem of really old material. What do we do with legacy data? Now, I mainly work in North Africa, and there the situation is pretty tragic. <clears throat> Excavation has been going on for 150 years. Archives are held in the most patchy kind of way by national institutions. And for Algeria, unfortunately, the archives at the moment of decolonization were removed to France and deposited in the Archive d'Outre-mer at the Centre Camille Julien in Aix-en-Provence. But otherwise, the situation is absolutely classic. Universities carry out research in Morocco. They take the data home. They don't give it to the national institution and uh, are extremely bad about this. However, there is a genuine desire on people's parts. I think all of the players that exist, uh, as far as we know, in Maghreb archaeology are actually interested in creating a way out of this problem. So the French School in Rome, this is an initiative I started with Stefano De Carro, again, now as head of ICROM. <laughs> Um, French School in Rome hosted a meeting in which 17 institutions, including almost all of those in the Maghreb, took part. And particularly the Centre Camille Julien and the University of Bordeaux, other French institutions that hold this sort of data. And what we agreed was that it would be a good thing to establish a platform. There was a lot of problem with its name because everything uh, every acronym we came up with turned out to be a dirty word in Arabic. Nahan is not. But that what we would do would be to establish a platform on a rather Ariadne-like basis where people could either deposit digitized material or at least deposit the catalogs. And that's the important thing. I mean, that is where, when people are looking at what are we going to do with this archive, especially as nobody really likes giving money to digitize anything anymore, um, the important thing is to get the metadata out there, to go for the catalog rather than the whole packet. I suppose this is rather like my idea about registers, that at least people can know what's going on. So what we're doing is um, this is the Ariadne model, the slide is Franco Nicolucci's, um, that you can put your data onto Ariadne, but you can also allow Ariadne to go and find it. The register is there, and that's the important thing. So we then went, money is uh, an object, obviously, because until we have an absolute watertight agreement between the 22 institutions, many of whom seem very reluctant to put signatures on documents. Um, we can't actually go and ask for it. But I did go to the DAI in Berlin, where Reinhard Fürsch said, what you can simply do is to peel off a portion of the wonderful Ariadne database as its structure, call it Nahan, so it doesn't look as if we have a German in Germany going on here. DAI will store all the data you like. This is exactly what they're doing for Syria. And um, the database, in effect, is already created. And what's the genius thing about this, and this again is ease, it's 
not making people in 16 countries fill out metadata forms. He proposes that you set up a folder tree, example here, in which you have a place idea, the year, the what are you doing, is it a photograph, is it a section, is it a plan, is it a, a notebook, what is it? And you put your digitized data or the label that it exists in it. No forms, easy for everybody. So to make this happen, we first have to get all those signatures. Um, and the second thing that we're going to have to do is to do a training course. Uh, this is proposed for Tunis, where we get um, members of all the countries in Maghreb to come <coughs> and study digital archiving for a month or so, and then use the common platform as a way to raise money from development ministries. We actually have a real issue here of the danger in which the Maghreb archaeological heritage finds itself, and there is money available uh, for this kind of initiative. Um, it should give le leverage for individual countries to put their own data online. Um, and it should uh, create a sort of virtuous circle in which as data gets added, people will see that it works. And so the third phase is this experimental uh, moment where we take, well, it's five archaeological sites for four countries, but one of them happens to be split in two at the moment. So we're going to take Volubilis, Cherchel, Carthage, Leptis Magna, and Cyrene, and see what comes out of people's depositories if we simply try and create archives for those five extraordinarily important sites. So this is very, very much a work in progress. We don't know where we're going, but you have to start somewhere. Above all, it's headed by ICROM, the International Center for Research in Rome, which is supranational, and so it doesn't feel as if it's a colonial initiative. We don't know whether it will work. The important thing is to try. So this brings me to a final point, that the creation of this sort of project, <coughs> Fasti or Nahan, is subject to political and social constraints. As I've already said, countries with strong national institutes of archaeology are better placed to implement centralized archives, but perhaps less well suited to making them available to the public who, after all, pays, a point that's been made by several of us. Knowledge is power. Making it available empowers. I naturally fall on the side of the latter, though fast it began to work when the Ministry of Culture made filling in the sheet obligatory. Thanks.